Okay, so that particular pump is a crescent gear pump. Now, do you remember the other two kinds of pumps? We talked about them before. The other two kinds of pumps, you've got a vein pump and you've got a gyrotor pump. I don't remember the gyrotor pump. Gyrotor. You remember the gyrotor pump? Huh? Gyrotor, it'd be like that. Okay, I'm going to show you what a gyrotor pump looks like. Uh, you know what a vein pump looks like? It's got a bunch of little veins all around. Yeah. This is the gyrotor pump right here. I'm going to show you this gyrotor pump. Now, this is a gyrotor oil pump for the Toyota Camry, but it's, uh, it is a gyrotor pump. And so, this is how a gyrotor pump works. It's got, see here? See that? When you turn that through, see how it works? That's a gyrotor. It's got a, the outside and the inside piece fit together real good, but they, and whenever, it, it makes a big place on one side that pulls oil in, and then whenever it's, by the time it's gone around to where it's uh, facing another hole, it forces it out the other way. But that oil pump, that's the oil pump, is a, this is a gyrotor style pump, and that's a crescent gear style. So I just, I just wanted to clarify that so whenever somebody talked about a gyrotor pump, you know what we're talking about. Well, it's sort of, yeah, except for some, and some of them have got, all, got more teeth than others. But you might notice that this little thing here has got four teeth, and this has got five. And there's also, it's got a little pin on the bottom so it's located. So that's pretty handy. It's good to know that, you know. And it will, it will it's a positive displacement pump, and that one there is too. And what, is it, what does it mean when you've got a positive displacement pump? What was the question? What is a positive displacement pump? What does that mean? That means if that pump is turning, something's going somewhere. Now, what is a, what is not a positive displacement pump? The bad one. Now, the positive displacement pump uh, that's not uh, one that's not is a water pump on a car. It's not a positive displacement pump because even if everything's stopped up, it can still spin. Well, if you stop up. The output on a positive displacement pump, it's not going anywhere, basically. And you do have a pressure relief and all that, but it's just keep, it, keep that in mind. All right, so there you go on that. Now, right here, let's, let's go on down. We're going to look at uh, that. Okay, Mopar remanufactured pumps with reduced clearances were approved for use. Like I say, it's an old handout, but warranty repairs on vehicles. All right, let's move on down here. We don't want to talk about warranty repairs because none of these are under warranty anyway. Uh, the 401 TE's valve body features a reverse vent reservoir check valve. Now, everybody's got to be familiar with those, right? Reverse vent reservoir check valves. You've all heard of those, haven't you? Make sure you get as confused as you can. Provides improved protection against wear from the overdrive clutch. And that's a different little thing. Not really a big deal unless you're a, you know, a real gearhead on automatic transmissions. You tell the difference between new valve bodies by looking at this, that, and the other. Okay? Look for these tools now. And all that. Think, look, pay attention to your questions so that as we come across them, you'll be able to know what they are. Okay. All right. Spline this one. We come on down here. Let me back up. Right there. There's your annulus assembly. The rear annulus gear been revised as of February 19, 1997, which is old. All right. The joint between the front carrier and the rear annulus is stronger. See that gear right there? That's an annulus gear, is what they call that. You're going to see that word again. It's going to interact with a set of clutches. Yeah. And actually, the, uh, there's another gear like that that does interact with your park paw. You know, so that whenever it puts it in park, it locks into that. Splines on the front carrier are now induction heat treated. It might appear it's heat damaged. You know, when you're induction heat treated, they're blued like a gun. You know, you see they're different colors, and it looks like it's... So if you see that, you might think it's uh, bad, but they've hardened it. Um, you know, have you, have you guys have ever... How many of you guys have ever drilled a hole... Trying to drill a hole in a piece of wood. I mean, not wood, but drill a whole piece of metal. And if you've done this very much. And so you got your drill, and you're just drilling and drilling and drilling. And all of a sudden, it seems like you just kind of stop. Your drill bit stops cutting, and it gets kind of hot. And you get another drill bit that's new, and it won't cut it either. And it gets dull really fast. What has happened there is you've actually heated that bolt up that you're trying to drill out to the point you've tempered it. And now it's really hard to cut it with anything. <laughs> you know, so that, well, you always use liquid. Uh, you know, like yeah, if you drilling. if you drill it not so fast, if you can slow your drill down and use some stuff to uh, lubricate it, some kind of penetrating oil or whatever, you know, then you're better off that way. 
All right. Now then, let's come on down here. The rear carrier. Now, what is this part right here when I talk about a carrier? What are you looking at right that's here? planetary. Yeah, that's actually a planetary gear set part right there. There's your planet gears. There's your ring gear and that kind of thing. It's upgraded fit. to a five pinion design. It's got five gears in there. One, two, three, four, five. See? That's going to fit inside of something not too uh, different from a sun shell. Yeah. Now you got a front sun gear on the 2 4 reverse hub. Been revised to increase the strength of the weld. See how they do all this stuff? They, they see where parts have failed and then they change them. Other internal component changes the flange, overdrive shafts, lead reaction shaft support, and so on and so forth. You know. Uh, the last revision concerns the number two and number five cage needle bearing. Now, I've told you about these things before. You don't need to put these things on upside down. You need to make sure you're putting them on the right way. And if you look at them carefully, you can tell when you're putting them on the right way. And I had one guy that put, them on, put one on backward, just messed up something terrible. Uh, reference the bill date on the transaction you're working on when you order a replacement part. See, that's really important to know what you're working on there. All right. Now, here's your electrical. Now, you're going to come across an answer to one of your questions here in a minute. Another change is the transmission range sensor, which was revised August 1998. The connector is a little larger than the earlier design, and the transaxle case has been adapted to meet the change. See that? There's a the transmission range sensor connector right there. And it's bigger than the one on the previous component. Obviously, if you try to put one of the other ones in there, it won't fit. Okay? Use a service seal when installing an earlier TRS in the service. Look at there. They actually gave you a different seal. So if you wanted to put the little one in there, it would go in there work. Is that cool or what? All right, blades are used instead of pins. They used to have little round pins, and now they're using blades there. TSB number 2104-99 for details, blah, blah, blah. All right, now this part right here, I'm going I'm to hit you with this because this is really important. You see this part right here? If you guys work anywhere and you fool with automatic transmissions very much at all, there's going to come a time when you are going to replace one of these things because they fail all the time. They've got them in stock in the parts house. That's how often they fail. The cool thing about it is they're right on the front of the transaxle and they're easy to change. You're going to get codes for them. It's going to throw you a code for the solenoid. You know, the, I just love it when these guys, and that's something you got to really applaud Chrysler for. That thing may fail now and then, but it's easy to change. You know, you basically, right on the front of the transaxle, it's easy to see. You got some bolts there, you pull it out, drop another one on there, make sure your gaskets are in place and right and all that kind of thing. Solenoid pressure switch. It's got solenoids in it, it's got pressure switch in it. All of that stuff is in one tiny little package. They don't spread it all over the place and you don't have to pull a transmission oil pan and take it off of there. Um, there was one of these transmissions, and this is something I thought was really interesting, in a Dodge Caravan that uh, the lady said that she had taken it somewhere and they said there was water in the transmission. So it was a transmission just like this one here, transaxle in a Dodge Caravan. So I pulled up dipstick and sure enough it looked a little milky and I said well maybe it's got a bad radiator in there that's letting the coolant get into the uh, you know to the transmission because you know the, most of them got a transmission cooler in the radiator. And then I got to investigating and that one has an external transmission cooler and there was nothing wrong with it so I don't know how the water got in it. But we just flushed the, we put, replaced this and we flushed the uh, transmission fluid with our transmission flush machine and it didn't give any more trouble. She's been driving it for months and months and months now. And I mentioned that in one of our articles that I wrote for Motor Age. And some guy that's a real expert on these transmissions wrote this scathing rebuke and said, that's the wrong way to fix the transmission. You should have done this and that and the other. If it even have a tablespoon of water in it. And the answer to him was, well, the proof's in the pudding. What we did fixed it, and she's got no complaints. <laughs> and we didn't have to charge her a big wad of money. You see what I'm saying? All right, so. Now, this part right here, I'm going to show you this right here, too. This is important. That speed sensor, there's two of those on the front of that transaxle. You can look down there and see them. They're little speed sensors. They've also got speed sensors like that in the side of some of these pickup truck transmissions. And those little plastic sensors fail all the time. You pull a code for one of those, coolest thing in the world, you just screw that plastic thing out, you screw another one back in there, you plug your wires in, you're good to go. We've changed them here. And somebody sent me an email one time saying they want $300 at a shop to change them. And I said, you can see those things. All you got to do is buy a couple of them. They're 30 bucks a piece or something. And screw them in there. So her and her boyfriend screwed them in there. And they had operational transmission, you know. But anyway, you're going to see those. And I've got another, tra I got a transaction like this, or transmission like this over there in the shop. And I can show you those. On. They're real easy to change on that. All right. Upgraded two-piece differential. Now, what's the differential for? Somebody tell me. What do we use the differential for? Gears the power to the wheels. Well, why do you need those gears in there, though, Sean? 
It does put power to the wheel, but why do you need the gears? Because it regulates it. it uh, you only want so many turns to the, from the drive shaft to get to the wheel. Well, when you're going around a curve, mm -hmm. one wheel rolling faster than the other, and those gears allow for that. If these knotheads are going to race down at Holt, weld their spider gears together in there, the little gears in the middle, you can't go around a curve without it going to slide one tire and spin in the other one. They got those gears in there, so it won't do that. They even do that on little small uh, race car. I mean, little cars like radio control cars with plastic gears. When we got some things. All right, new transact ATF fluid, ATF plus four, fill for life fluid used in '99 and later JA vehicles. Running uh, in 2000 NS vehicles. You seeing any of this stuff? Right? You see any? Can you see your questions? Mm. I don't see any at all. I see those vehicle reference. Let me turn this back on so you can see your papers because you guys are having trouble. I can tell. All right. You got it. <coughs> now, if we miss it when we're going through the handout, we'll go through the answer here in a minute because we got some time. All right. The operation is one is controlled by the transmission control module, TCM. That's what it looked like. It looked kind of like an engine controller. Uh, incidentally, if the same module controls the engine and the transmission, they call it a uh, PCM. If the different module controls the transmission, they call the engine control module an ECM, and they call the transmission control module a TCM. It determines the shift schedule by monitoring inputs and controlling outputs. That's what all these computers do. Solenoid clutch activation, torque converter, clutch engagement, and so on and so forth. All right, you can see there's your little flash tab on the MDS-2. Uh, we're going to do that. Okay. Some transaxial symptoms can be fixed by updating the software in the transmission control line, which can be accomplished by reflashing the software electronically. We've done that. Now, one time, whenever I was working at the dealership, there was this Dodge truck that was had a diesel in it, and the automatic transmission was hunting in and out of fourth gear going down the road. And there was guys going to buy it. He said, I'll buy this truck if you can fix this. So we were swamped in the shop back there, so they took it over to the transmission shop, and they said, put a throttle position sensor on it, which it had one, even though it was a diesel, because it had an electronic transmission. And if that don't fix it, we'll go into the transmission and figure out what's wrong with it. So they brought it over there, and I pulled it out of my stall, and I hooked the uh, DRB3 up to it, which is a big scan tool, and use it for a bridge between the computer that's hooked to Chrysler. And the computer hooked to Chrysler identified that vehicle and said, uh, there is a reflash available for this thing for the transmission control module. And I looked at the details of the reflash and it says if it's hunting in and out of fourth gear going down the road, this reflash will fix it. Okay, so I did the reflash on it and fixed that thing where it wouldn't do that anymore going down the road. All I did was just, you know, you tell it you want to reflash it and it, you see a little progress bar crawling across there when it's done this. It goes, yeah, you're through. Put this sticker on it and date it and all that. So I did that and they took it down the road and the guy was like, yay, I'll buy the truck. So he buys the truck and they bought me a steak dinner. <laughs> Because it didn't have to be rebuilt. You know, he was tickled. But see, sometimes looking at the TSBs and stuff, if you're smart, you'll look at the TSB, and a lot of times you'll fix one real fast instead of digging and hunting and trying to figure out why it's going in and out. It's a, it's a software problem. You get where I'm going? If it's a software problem and you can reflash it, you reflash it. You don't have to change any parts or tighten any bolts or nothing. All right. Now, then, according to the Star Center, which is the, where they keep the database up there, the four most common reasons for calls about the 41T include vehicle limp in mode operation. That is the mode it goes into when there's a problem and it can't work right, and it changes into a mode of operation where it doesn't shift gears, it's just in one gear, and it's so you can go places, but you're always in third gear or something. You know, when you take off, it doesn't take off all that good because you're in two thousand of gear, but it's a limp in mode. All right, so, so a limp in mode, gear noise issues, we've got that. You know that little Dodge Stratus? How many of you have driven that Dodge Stratus and you heard that thing going? You know? <laughs> it's a it's a funky noise. It almost sounds like a pump. All right, so uh, yeah, shift shutter or harshness, and that's when it shut. You know, shifts it like that. And then operative conditions, and sometimes they're electronic and can be eliminated by reflashing or replacing the transmission control module. Use the flash tab on the MDS2, which is the machine that I was using. Oh, here's a funny story. Uh, on the back of the MDS DS2 machine, there was a telephone, and it was a military-grade thing, man. If you picked it up, that receiver was heavy, and that cord was thick, and it felt like it was made for shop use. But when you picked it up, it would dial the Chrysler hotline. Beep, 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 beep. And whenever you, they'd say Chrysler hotline. But I had a phone wire, but somebody could call it, 
if they knew the number, and I wired the phone line up to it, so I knew the number. <coughs> and if they called it, it would ring, and you would hear it all over the shop. Whoa, 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 whoa. The loudest ringer I've ever heard, you know, because it was for a shop. And so I went one day going out of town, and I says, and, and Donnie's girlfriend at the time, she's his wife now, she was working up there at a credit union, and I stopped there to get some money before I went to Georgia. And uh, she says, uh, how can I get a hold of Donnie down there? Because there were no cell phones in those days. And uh, there is a phone out there ringing them. And I said, this uh, this silly thing here, uh, if you call that MDS machine phone number, it will ring. And if it rings, Donnie will pick it up because he worked right in that area. And I said, but since you want to talk to him, why don't you just call him and tell him that you're the IRS and you're going to audit his tax return? <laughs> and so... His, his, her friend called and did that and all that. I, came, I got back on Monday and I says, did you get a call from the IRS? He goes, man, that phone rung on the back of that machine and I picked it up and it said, this is a, a strange voice and this is the IRS and we're going to audit your tax return and my heart stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, did you think it was strange they were calling you on that machine? He goes, I don't worry about all of that. All our, <laughs> <I'm ready. laughs> Scared the stew out of him. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and look through it, see what more of this stuff right here. Look at this. Oh, I see an answer to a question here. A new item you may have seen around your shop is the two lady 333 transmission simulator was delivered in 99, whatever. Uh, the 41 d 42 le overlay adapts the simulator for use. With, that's what it looks like. Right? All right, so you can use the transmission simulator. Basically what that simulator is going to do, y'all, is you're going to basically be able to plug that thing into the transmission You've taken your transmission control module out of the loop, and you're actually going to be able to select the gear that you want it to be in so you can see if the transmission can work like it's supposed to independently of the engine, con I mean, of the transmission controller, and you can see what the value is in that. You're checking the wire harness and everything that way. It's real smooth the way that worked. All right. Huh? Let's see. Yeah, see that? There you go. That's number one. Which one you got? One. Can we use a 41T, 42LE, and what? 45 RFE. Yeah, 45RFE. There you go. There's a the transaxle on that. Let's see. Okay, look at the look at all the torque converter break in. Look at this. Watch this. Uh, let's see. Torque converter break in. Look at that. Because of the uh, plus four is the ATF plus four. Because of that enhanced friction properties. You'll have to set what's called a torque converter break-in adjustment with the DRB3 whenever you replace the torque converter on 2,000 model year minivans. And they sh uh, the older ones should not use plus four because the break-in adjustment is not available on that. And so basically, what did it say right there? C. All right, you got that one right, okay? C. All right. All right, now that's as far as I'm going to go slogging through this handout. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this around. And I'm going to go ahead and blow you guys through the rest of these. Let's, which ones you didn't get the answer to, right? Two, three, five. Number two, how has the rear carrier and the 41TE transaxle been upgraded? D, C. Well, that's actually C there. The carrier's got five pinion gears. Of course, I remember, well, Daniel, yeah, I could see how you got confused because weld thickness had been doubled on that other part. Remanufactured pumps can be used as replacement parts on new or unsold vehicles. That is absolutely false. Of course, you know, that's not anything you're going to be... A new vehicle, it gets a new part. If it's a new vehicle that had not been sold, if it's still on the showroom floor, that, but we're not dealing with that here. Uh, set the torque converter break-in adjustment after replacing the... You know about that one. Number four, that was A. Number five, what change has recently been made to the D. differential on the transaxle? Number five. I got A. I got C. And D. How about D, the dog? Two-piece differential. Five, right? Yeah. And when checking clutch clearances with the input uh, clutch pressure fixture, you're supposed to apply shop air to the fixture at how many PSI? 30 PSI. What do you think, y'all? 30 PSI. Now, y'all went over to the transmission shop. He just put very old shop air in there, didn't he? Well, all right. Just pure old 100 pound shop air, whatever, 150. Number seven, the solenoid pressure switch assembly has been upgraded for the 2000 model year. How can you tell if a 41TE transactional has been upgraded unit or the previous version? And number seven, that's the sound shield and separator plate are not used with the revised assembly. I can see all that you guys have all got a, a perfect 
inside view of that. In addition to the strengthened joint between the front carrier <laughs> and the Nullis gear, how has the front carrier and Nullis assembly been improved? Number eight. The splines on the front carrier are induction heat treated. In the identification code for the 41TE, what do the three digits immediately following the K stand for? Uh, I see the assembly plan. No, that's the last three digits of the part number. Okay, it's stand for D, right? D. Oh, man. Yeah, D. Assembly plan code. No, I mean the, okay. the ones immediately following the K are actually the last three digits of the part number. And finally, information about the correct type of ATF to use in a particular application can be found either on the dipstick in the owner's guide or in the service manual. All of the above. All of the above.